December 8th, 1963, a day like any other. At Aldinga Beach, the annual South Australian Spear Fishing Championships are set to begin. Twenty-three-year-old Rodney Fox, a life insurance salesman from Adelaide and former champion, takes to the water. He sets his sights on a large reef fish. Little does he know that he himself is being stalked by a great white shark. Through a series of near miracles, Rodney Fox arrives at Royal Adelaide Hospital in under an hour. The vascular surgeon there has just returned from an international conference with the very latest in surgical techniques. They go to work on the mutilated body delivered to the operating theater. The shark has punctured his left lung, left clavicle, and diaphragm. The jaws have bitten through all his ribs gouge skin and muscle from his left side and expose several major organs. According to one surgeon, had Rodney arrived five minutes later, he would have bled to death. Sewn back together with over 450 stitches, he lies bedridden for two months with the pain and the awful memory. Do you hope to continue skin diving one day? Uh, I'll get in the water somewhere sometime, but I don't know whether I'll uh, go in this, this gulf here where there's been two or three attacks in the last few years. That was Rodney Fox then. And this is Rodney Fox now. Seldom has a single event so radically transformed a person. In a way, the great white shark that attacked him 30 years ago took his young life, but gave him another. In three decades, Rodney Fox has grown from a fearful shark victim into a shark champion and protector. I think the sharks in the shark world is really beautiful and interesting. But the shark gets a raw deal. And people just hate it because they don't understand and they fear it. I love to see them flying and gliding through the water and I, I think that most people would really enjoy it too if they realized they weren't going to be eaten alive. This from a man who was himself nearly eaten alive. Rodney's life since the attack has been a continuous challenge to overcome his fear by facing it. Today, documentary filmmakers and marine scientists from all over the world travel to Australia to go looking for sharks with Rodney. His knowledge of living sharks is unparalleled. 
marine biologist Eugenie Clark. People who hear about Rodney's shark attack, they go, wow, he's, he's an ordinary man like one of us. And yet, he had such a terrible experience. And on top of that, he's telling us that sharks aren't dangerous. They're good. We should preserve them. So this is what's so wonderful about Rodney, that somebody that suffered through such a terrible incident can now defend the animal that attacked him. It wasn't always that way. Reliving the shark attack story has been a, a continuous epic in my life. So many people want to hear how I survived, how I stuck my fingers in the shark's eyes, how I put my arms around it so it wouldn't bite, and how I went up to the surface and it followed me. And after about eight or nine years of telling the story, I read the original Reader's Digest first person award that I had written immediately afterwards, and I found I had changed the story a little. I was uh, telling people what they wanted to hear and not necessarily the truth. <laughs> Time often affects memory. Here, the story is only two days old, and not nearly so heroic. All I remember is this big thing pushing me through the water. And um, it uh, seemed to let go a bit when I pushed my hand up on it. And it still wouldn't let go of the pressure. The water might have been holding it in, uh, in his mouth. And I managed to put both arms right around him and, and I was looking for his eyes with my fingers. And after a while he managed just to let go. And uh, he, I managed to get to the surface. Very luckily there was a boat just coming over to see what was going on because there was so much blood and, and uh, disturbance in the water. And they quickly rolled me into the boat. I had to keep both arms just like this so they wouldn't rip my arms off. As they came to shore along this incredibly rough area there, they drove the boat up onto the shore and they loaded me onto a bit of a stretcher and a car, the only car in the whole area that had been in this beach for about four or five years was available and they drove it out over the reef with 10 or 20 guys lifting it over the big lumps of the rocks through here loaded me in the back of it, took off towards Adelaide. It was uh, an absolute miracle, especially when they loaded me, unloaded me out of the boat. As they did, my wetsuit slid open and my stomach actually, start, loops of intestine came out, which seems funny now. I've got a good friend who actually tells me quite every now and again that he stuffed them back in with his fingers and they bunched me up. Oh, it was his test. Rodney's wife, Kay. But I didn't know how bad it was for for many days afterwards, but by then he was up and breathing and talking and so, you know, it's only later when they tell you all the things that were wrong, you realise just how close it was. But everyone in the hospital thought he was dying, but I knew he wasn't. His attack drew worldwide attention. Rodney became a sensation almost overnight. The public notoriety would set his life on a brand new course. Three months after the attack, escorted by Kay, Rodney began his return to the sea. But it wasn't easy to forget his attack. The fear of the sharks when I went back in the water was huge. My first time my head went underwater, I imagined in my mind sharks running in from all directions and I said, stop it, you've got to control that. Things would never exactly return to normal for Rodney. His love of the sea was now overshadowed by a terrible fascination with his old nemesis, the shark. In 1965, he helped organize the first expedition to track the Great White. The adventure became a docudrama. But danger in the unknown makes man himself the quarry of the most savage hunter of the deep. The great white shark. The white pointer. Great white death. Come on, you bastard, attack. 
This is some of the first footage ever shot of a great white underwater. Coming in. Now! Doesn't taste so good, that wire mesh. The theme is revenge, a crusade to rid the seas of evil sharks. Gapped and the battle's almost over. A second man-eater whose jaws will never again menace an unsuspecting swimmer. In those days, people feared sharks because they knew very little about them. They thought that every shark was a bad shark. And there was a big saying at that stage that the best shark is a dead shark. The first film was followed by a second. Attacked by a killer shark is about Rodney, his attack and recovery. Again, it shows Rodney wielding a spear gun, bent on revenge. Time out to reload. The cartridge inside the head explodes on contact. The tremendous concussion is transmitted into the body, killing instantly. But it does twist the truth just a little. I wasn't really after revenge. What I was frightened of was going back in the water and being bitten again. And so I was quite keen to try out the new explosive power head that had been invented. And I went underwater and I shot some of these sharks on film to show that man could protect himself in the water. Rod's on a killing frenzy, intoxicated with his success of overriding his fears. This is exactly the scene he had been in need of. In fact, Rodney's attitude was beginning to change a fact obscured by the dramatic film script. I didn't realize or understand much at that time, but I thought, that's not the right attitude. We've got to look at it further than that. We've got to learn more about them and understand them and learn to live with them. As Rodney's appreciation for the great white began to grow, so too did his expertise as a shark tracker. In 1969, he was called into work on a shark movie unlike any that had gone before. Has that cage been checked out? Film producer Peter Gimbel turned to Rodney to deliver the sharks for his cameras. Well, generally, well, after they've had a taste, they start really to tear into things and really start to be active. And then you'll let us get in the water. <laughs> I'll push you. <laughs> the result, the critically acclaimed documentary, Blue Water, White Death. In the crew was diver cameraman Stan Waterman, the two men would become lifelong friends. It's gotta be 12. Oh, yeah, you need 12. Look at him, oh. Rodney had already done two films about the Great White, and Rodney probably knew more about how to chum in the Great White. Very important, that chumming, the putting out of what is called Burley in Australia, to attract him so that Rodney was the natural man to set up the scene for us. Rodney didn't have a cage back then. Gimbal had the cages. Rodney knew where to find the, the burly, the chum, and set up the boats. And way back then at the beginning, Rodney was your man in Australia if you wanted to film the Great White. The carnage of earlier films was not repeated. Blue Water, White Death marks the beginning of a new kind of relationship between white sharks and human beings. One that allows the sharks to survive the encounter. For Rodney Fox, the occasional filmmaking stint was not enough to support his young family. So he took up abalone diving, a dangerous but lucrative profession. It would put food on the table for 18 years. But always the sharks weighed heavily on his mind. 
one of the hardest things was to do over that 18 year period when I was abalone diving was when I had to return to abalone diving the week after I'd been out filming sharks. We'd attracted maybe 10 or 15 great whites around the boat during that week period. We'd had them biting on the cages and taking baits and showing these enormous teeth. And when the film crew had left and everything had quietened down, I had to make my living again and go back in the water only a few miles from where we'd seen all these sharks. I'd had to put on another hat and say to myself, sharks don't like abalone. They generally don't eat humans. You'll be okay. But the first couple of days, I imagine those sharks were looking at me. And sometimes when my knee would hit a soft sponge, I wondered whether that was a, a shark, whether it was a soft shark's belly and whether it was biting my leg off. But I knew that it was fear in myself. The danger to abalone divers was genuine enough. Some of the best abalone beds were near seal colonies where white sharks liked to hunt. But instead of killing the sharks, Rodney and his colleagues designed a protective working cage for the abalone divers. Then they tested it in shark-infested waters. that that cage is safe to, to abalone dive out of because you've been in, involved with five sharks down here swimming around attacking it and they've only taken the hose and if you've got enough air to survive and you can get up to the surface yeah. you, you'll be safe. Exactly, yeah. That's the adrenaline pump, isn't it? The adrenaline really started to pump in 1974 when Rodney was contracted to coordinate the filming of live sequences for the greatest shark film of all time. He had had experience with filming great whites in the wild, but Jaws was a different kind of project. They'd sent over a, a small stunt man, a, a midget diver, in a small cage so that the sharks would look bigger. Because Jaws, of course, Bruce was a 25-footer uh, and our sharks were only 14-footer. And as we were dressing uh, the little guy, one of the sharks came in and grabbed hold of the propeller on my boat and actually shook the boat physically. And it was well over 14 feet long and a very strong shark. And as it swam along the side, I'm saying to Carl, quick, get in the water, get in the water, the cameraman's ready, here's the sharks. And he's saying, no, no, no. The stunt diver wasn't the only one who didn't want to go in the water. Jaws was great entertainment, but the public was terrorized and the perception of sharks went from bad to worse. Nobody realised at that time that it was going to be a horror film that was going to frighten so many people, including a lot of my friends, out of the water. I had people say to me, I wouldn't even go in the bath now after seeing the film Jaws. For Rodney, Jaws was the turning point, the moment he finally realised that the sharks needed a champion, and so he set out to debunk the old myths. He started a business, an expedition business, taking filmmakers, scientists, even tourists out into the South Australian seas for face-to-face -face encounters 
with the real great white sharks. These days, his business serves two ends. It contributes to marine science, and it satisfies Rodney's rather large appetite for adventure. Some experience, I tell you. This scientific expedition will drop anchor in the Neptune Islands off the rugged coast of South Australia to find, film, and study great white sharks. <laughs> Rodney's son, Andrew, has taken over the necessary, if noxious, chore of mixing the key ingredients of burley, a kind of foul stew that sharks seem to find irresistible. Blood, ground tuna, and a little seawater. That's the recipe. Andrew will create a smelly slick stretching several miles down current from the vessel. Any sharks in the area will find the invitation very attractive. Marine scientists from the University of Adelaide want to test the strength of a great white's bite and to identify the telltale signs of shark attack for forensic purposes. A grisly but necessary study. The sharks must be induced to bite a specifically designed pressure plate. First, they need to be worked into a biting mood. Now that the shark has the idea, he gets his tuna on a plate. Keep it in the air anyway, because he's a bit cranky. Running tests on the great white sharks in the wild is always unpredictable. <laughs> the plate is designed to measure pounds of pressure per square inch. How are you boys? We're out of the calibration range here. We'll have to recalibrate this. That is amazing. You know, we're looking at the test strip now, and that looks as though that's... That's more than the... This one is 500 kilograms, 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. That one's more than 1,000 pounds. A thousand pounds per square inch, enough to puncture metal plating. But what exactly is it that draws a great white and prompts it to bite? Is it the smell of prey, or the sight of it, or the vibrations it sends through the water? That's a crucial question for divers, so Rodney helped set up another experiment. What I hope to do here is to really work out whether the great white sharks are interested in humans, whether they can actually see that there is a, a shield, an unseen shield there, whether they can detect that, and whether they may be interested in the fish or sound 
and whether just just to see just what they are interested in. They swim around and around so many times the cages without biting, um, and we haven't had any true results. In order to test sight, Rodney will use a cage of quarter-inch Lexan plastic to give the sharks a clear view of his shape. An underwater speaker will test for sound, broadcasting low-frequency vibrations to simulate the vibrations made by moving prey. A thawed tuna will provide scent. Will the shark show any clear preference? Which one will attract them the most? The adrenaline that brushes in you as you go down there and as a shark comes in when you're in the Lexan tube gives you a real rush. It's excitement all over again. It's like the first time in my shark cages. It's exciting and uh, my heart, you can feel it a little higher and you're beating a little faster as you realise that you are part of an experiment, that the sharks don't really know whether they can get at you or not. It was quite unnerving really because I felt like I was naked in the middle of a street with a shop window and with everything exposed. Again and again the circling sharks pass Rodney by and return to the source of the sound vibrations. The proof is clear. At close range underwater vibrations, not sight or smell, are what attracts the shark. Rows of sensory cells along the shark's flank are especially attuned to these stimuli. No, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind they were far more interested in the low vibrations oh, than yes. they ever were in, in, in me yes. or yes. the tuna. The more Rodney has studied them, the more he has come to learn about sharks. The great variety of sharks, all 370 species of them. I get lots of pleasure from looking at the different species of sharks, from the carpet shark that lays on the bottom with his frilly mouth. To the nurse sharks that seem to rummage around and sleep a lot. beautiful whaler sharks and the bull sharks and the silky sharks and the, there's so many the mako sharks and the great white sharks it's all of them have a different field a different way to swim a different way of life but they're all beautiful the way they they swim and glide and fly through the water and the biggest and most mysterious of all the whale shark It's not just the largest of the sharks. It is, in fact, the largest fish in the ocean. But despite its menacing size and appearance, this is among the most gentle and benign of all sharks. It eats plankton, not people. Few in number, slow to reproduce, the whale shark is one of the great and vulnerable wonders of the oceans. Whale sharks to the diver have been one of the, the greatest pinnacles of sharks in all the, the oceans of the world. 
They were the largest shark. They were a docile shark. They were a shark that you could hitch a ride on, or a friendly shark. All the things that the great white shark wasn't. Growing to over 50 feet and 20 tons, the whale shark is so big that it supports other fish, like these remora. They hitchhike harmlessly on the whale shark and eat the food it leaves behind. Ironically, the most visible fish in the ocean is also one of the least understood. No one can say where or when these sharks reproduce or even how old they grow to be. But some scientists believe they live as long as we do, roaming the tropical oceans in search of food and occasionally each other. Now imagine a shark this big with teeth to match, a massive meat-eating predator. At one time, such a shark did exist. Carcharodon megalodon, 50 feet of carnivore lived during the Miocene era some 20 million years ago. It was the largest ocean-going predator that ever existed. Rodney traveled to South Carolina to find out more about the megalodon. He and naturalist Vito Bertucci will dive in the Cooper River off Charleston. It's a dangerous dive. But this was a hunting and dying ground for Carcharodon megalodon, and his fossilized teeth lie embedded in the river bottom. The most important thing to worry about here is the current. Uh, just to work your way into the current and down the anchor line. And then once we get down, you have to be aware that there are sharks and turtles in this area and an occasional alligator. And uh, if you do come up on one, not to be startled by it. And uh, if you ignore them, they usually ignore you. Alligators, the only danger with them is on the surface. Yeah. If you see one come at you at the surface, all you have to do is dump your air and go down. And they won't come after you. Or attack you. Uh, the sharks, if they come up to you, just give them a shot and they'll take off. Well, I got my knee pads on for praying. I hope this turns out all right. <laughs> That'll be good. And here goes my mask. And... The water is cold. Visibility is nil. The darkness is decidedly spooky. I had some incredible images of monster sharks swimming around. In these gloomy waters, a monster carnivore would be right at home. Within minutes, Rodney finds the first traces of these ancient killers. Luckily, of course, it's the teeth, not the shark. Houdini. Why this, are they different colors? This one was in the sand. On the sand? Yeah, in the yeah. sand, and these were in the mud. In the mud, like a bit further away. Yeah. You know, when I was heading down there with you for the first time, I thought, what am I doing here? It was <laughs> dark and crazy, and I'm pulling, and I'm spinning sideways on the rope down there. And it was only when I saw the bottom come up slowly that I realized there was a steady bottom there. And I thought, I can't give up now because I can't get back in the boat. <laughs> and, and then I went on, and then when I saw that first half a tooth down there, I thought, ah, oh, this is what it is. And then I started looking, looking, and I forgot about all the problems of the, that you told me about down there and started looking, 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 looking for teeth. And, you know, you can get carried away. <laughs> down in Jacksonville, Florida, Cliff Jeremiah is taking Vito's fossil teeth and reconstructing a megalodon shark jaw. It will be the largest shark jaw in the world, big enough to swallow a small car. And it has an entire set of properly matched teeth.
It has taken Vito 19 years to collect the full set. Some 200 fossilized teeth will line the recreated jaw, adding almost 300 pounds in teeth alone. Shark teeth, of course, stand out so much so. the white, pointy, ivory things, knives against their grey body. And of course, if you had somebody in a room pointing a revolver at you, you'd look at the revolver too, because it's the sharp pointy and the point that's going to cause all the trouble. Shark teeth are compelling. It's difficult not to admire them and react with a shudder. The only part of the shark skeleton that's not cartilage. These razor teeth are used to dismember and devour prey. But despite our worries, only rarely is that prey human. First of all, the word shark is such a, an enormous pull on people. Sharks, three or four hundred varieties of sharks in the world all go together as one name, shark, and that spells out fear. Research was done and shows that the word shark had a higher reaction on the nervous system of people than any other word in the English language. And so general, the general public, when they talk about sharks, they talk about something they cannot understand and something they fear. In fact, sharks are not all scary. Only a handful are any kind of threat to people. What they are is vitally important to the oceans. As top predators, they help maintain the entire balance of the underwater world. Rodney's fascination with these great hunters has taken him all around the planet. His quest to learn still more about sharks. And it's a quest that never ends. All right, we're going to place the mask on, and the way to do that is to put your chin in first, and then we'll pull this strap over the top. Here at Walker's Cay in the northern Bahamas, Rodney and Dr. Eugenie Clark have come to swim with reef sharks in the wild. On this dive, Rodney and Eugenie are wearing special masks that allow them to communicate underwater. No metal cages, no Lexan tubes, just to swim alongside the sharks, to show that if you know what you're doing, you have nothing to fear. They've picked a dive center where frozen fish remains are put out to lure large numbers of sharks for the divers. The nurse sharks are the first to arrive. They don't seem to be paying any attention to us, do they? Well, they're not paying any While the nurse sharks are fairly docile, the black tips that follow are much more aggressive.
tried to bite me on the camera, so I suppose they are dangerous. <laughs> Yet even the black tip and gray reef sharks seem more interested in the food than the humans. There are almost 80 sharks feeding simultaneously, and for the most part, they simply ignore the divers. In fact, today, people threaten sharks more than sharks threaten people. Sharks are being killed, sometimes purely out of hate. They don't even use them. If some of the shark tournaments where they just go out and kill sharks. But I think we're getting away from that. There's too much now in television and uh, magazine articles and books and people like Rodney Fox who are telling people what good sharks can be and who are living examples of how if you understand a shark you can go on swimming with them and they're not to be feared and hated. They're just sniffing like little puppy dogs, aren't they? Some sharks you can swim with, some you can't. It takes some education, experience and common sense to figure out which ones are safer than others. Silky sharks, for instance, are on the safe list. And with silkies, there's a twist, as Bahamian Stuart Cove will show Rodney. And when we go down there, you're going to twist its tail. When it, it's important um, when the sharks, we're swimming around the sharks, keep our hands down because they do have teeth. Um, but we can, when they swim by us, if you grab their tails and twist them gently, it will paralyze the shark. And when you do that, you can actually roll them over, uh, stroke their bellies. We, we use this uh, maneuver to actually remove fish hooks. And so we, we sort of do the sharks a little bit of a favor and, and remove the fish hooks. And it doesn't seem to bother them. You can paralyze the sharks and then release the sharks. They'll come right back to you and you can do it again. Well, I'm going. <laughs> Let's try it. Silky sharks are so called because instead of the usual rough shark skin, theirs is smooth as silk. Reaching up to nine feet in length, they inhabit the waters off Nassau to the south of Walker's Cay. Grabbing silkies by the tail might sound tricky, but divers in the area have been doing it for a while ever since they first set out to remove the hooks of careless fishermen. That's when they discovered the silkies' special weakness. It's called tonic immobility, and it's a quirk of the shark's nervous system. A kind of temporary paralysis brought on by twisting the shark's tails and flipping them over.
believe this. Those sharks are so friendly. They're they're right behind you. They're all around. That's incredible. Hey, yeah. I've never seen anything like that before. So sh- no, no, no. silkies are friendly. Nurses are okay. What about any others? You got any other dangerous we, sharks? We got uh, no dangerous sharks in the Bahamas. Yeah? Uh, fortunately, two weeks ago, we had a longline boat come into our area and target our shark dive and uh, out up in the reef area on the inland, inland sites and, and caught 35 of our shark population. And they all had different names and they were they were like our kids. Like a, It was like having your, your pet dog killed and we, we had a great affinity a great affection for all these um for these wonderful sharks well after that great white shark got me i really knew nothing about sharks and here yeah you, you know this is one of the 350 varieties of sharks in the world and you just have to find one out which ones are potentially man eaters or man biters as they say i'm less frightened now than uh, i was before my shark attack because i've learned to uh, find out which ones are dangerous and which ones aren't, which ones you can handle, which ones you can swim with. I think they're beautiful. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Felicity. Margaret. Boys and girls. Many different uh, shapes and sizes. Come on. It's my belief that education will, will stop this massacre of all the sharks and the massacre of our oceans. There's a great updwelling amongst people now to say hey let the sharks live let's learn more about them let's find out how we can enter the waters without having to kill them all off and it's the education of our younger people now and i see a a large uprising of it young six and seven year olds saying don't throw any plastic in the water don't do this why are you killing that shark why is that photograph of a dead shark it's really great to see that we are starting to to let our seas live For Rodney Fox, the past 30 years have been a journey, a journey with the shark. It was a voyage that started in one terrible instant, a voyage into the face of fear. Over 30 years, Rodney has traveled from terror and death to understanding and life. From the early days when killing sharks seemed right to the present when harming them, even accidentally, seems very wrong. In a way, he was chosen on that awful day 30 years ago to speak for the sharks. Chosen for a special lifelong bond. For while the great white would put one mark on his body, the next 30 years would leave another on his soul. 30 years ago, I had no idea I'd be dragged into a whole lifetime of study of sharks. And when I look back now, I I realize that and feel quite proud that I've worked with so many interesting people. And what I've tried to do over that period of time is to get the the respected filmmakers and the the scientists that know what they're talking about to learn more about the great white and get them to portray that the shark isn't a bad shark, that we have to learn to live with it and not just kill it. And I look back over 30 years to find that slowly it's been happening and working and all of the people agree with my philosophy. Let the sharks live.